The two pink lines staring back at me were causing fireworks to go off inside of my brain. It was the 4th of July, and I had taken the pregnancy test in order to put my, why am I feeling funny, fears to rest. I was already the mother of a two-year-old boy and an eight-month-old girl. The idea of three babies in three years was a terrifying thought. But that's exactly what was happening. <laughs> Whenever friends would ask about the pregnancy or gender of the baby, I would offer the classic response, I don't really care. I just want my baby to be healthy. If we are totally honest with ourselves, however, we want more. Looking back, I think it was then that I caught my first glimpse of the elephant in the room. We would never say it out loud, but the truth is, many women are silently wishing for their unborn child to be beautiful, intelligent, athletic, creative, musical, and just the right amount of popular. You know, that level of unpopular that ensures nobody will pick on them, but not so popular that the kid that hosts parties at your house when you're out of town. <laughs> the very moment we make assumptions about who our child must be, we unknowingly steal of the little unforeseen beauty of all that they might be before we have ever even met them. As soon as I had given birth and they placed the baby onto my chest, I could tell that something was wrong. Why was she so purple? I had expected to see my picture-perfect baby, but instead I was staring into this little person whose face was shadowed by a fiery crimson masquerade mask, and yet strangely shared my same blue eyes. The bruising, if that's what I was seeing across her face, seemed to continue down the majority of her body. I was barely allowed to kiss her tiny hand before the nurse uttered, I'm just so sorry. And then they swept my child away. Everything went quiet, except for a ringing I had in my ears. It was almost as if I had vanished from the room, but I could still see the bustle of people around me. I don't even recall being taken to my recovery room, but hours passed before the doctors ever came in to speak with me. I was informed that my daughter had been born with two separate and rather extensive vascular conditions, one of which impacts only around 100 children worldwide. They called it birthmarking. Lots of babies are born with forms of birthmarking. We give it cute names like stork bites and angel kisses. This was different. Over 60% of my baby's body, including her face, her chest, her right arm, her right hand, and her legs and her back were all covered with extra vessels that had no intention of fading. One of the most devastating potential complications was that she might possess a debilitating net of vessels over her brain. I confess, I cried for the better part of the two days we were in the hospital. My heart had to mourn the loss of expectations I had made for my baby before she was ever born. My soul had to accept the truth that parenting never gives us guarantees. As my husband and I walked out of the hospital that cool March morning, all the things that I had wanted for my child, what I imagined for our family, simply faded away. And I was left with the what is and a determination to be the best advocate possible for my child. I was staring into the face of the elephant in the room. We were thrown into a world of specialists. Receptionists would initially inform me I would have to wait months before seeing these special doctors. After sending an email with her photo and some information, I never knew if I should be relieved or alarmed when the specialists themselves would call us back and say they had made room in their schedule for us that very same week. We endured a variety of testing and MRIs as we worked our way down a very long checklist. And in the end, the determination was there were no significant medical side effects connected with her condition. I recall the specialist actually being stunned when her brain scans came back normal. Before we could even catch our breath, we were quickly thrown into the treatment phase. The skin of small children heals fast, so the dermatologist wanted to begin treatment immediately when she was just six months old. The protocol utilized a laser technology that promised to diminish the appearance of the vessels. If left untreated, we were told that over time, the weight of the additional vessels under her skin would cause her face to appear as if it were melting. 
Over the course of the next several years, my daughter and I would rise before the sun and drive to Children's Hospital. Every one of her 13 treatments involved the use of anesthesia. And though I was grateful that the doctors let me hold her as she drifted off, there is something haunting about feeling your child's body fall limp in your arms. After treatment, my sweet baby looked very much like a little cheetah. As we waited in the post-op recovery area one morning, I recall taking a photo of her innocently sucking on a dark purple popsicle. I realized later it was the exact same color as the hundreds of dime-sized bruises that covered her entire body. And though the bruises were not painful, they did take weeks to fade, and taking her into public was hard. I tried to ignore the elephant in the room, but the questioning looks and obvious whispers of strangers made it difficult to do so. Today, many would deem my daughter's journey an example of a medical success. In many respects, she responded better than I had ever dreamed to treatment. Her right cheek and right hand still possessed the most obvious lingering traces because they had multiple layers of the vascular netting. She's four now. We had our first real conversation about her condition just a few months ago. She had walked into the office and found me flipping through some of her newborn pictures on the computer. She had honestly never seen them before. She stared at the screen and frowned and then said, why am I so red? I don't like it. I felt a lump form in my throat, but it was the perfect chance to share with her a little of her story. Later that night, when my husband came home from work, she bounced across the kitchen and said, Daddy, I don't know if you know this about me, but when I was born, I was just a little bit red. <laughs> my husband simply smiled and replied, Oh, really? <laughs> Perhaps not by coincidence, my daughter's favorite stuffed animal has always been a soft gray elephant. Four years later, it still goes everywhere with her. For me, it serves as a reminder that one of the greatest challenges in motherhood is helping our children to become the best possible version of themselves, even when that version looks nothing like we had imagined. I have now come to believe that some of the most rewarding moments in motherhood are found not when we attempt to ignore the elephants in the room, but when we teach our children to embrace them. I now think it's possible these elephants just might be the keepers of the most beautiful parts of our children's souls.